Hi everyone and welcome to video number 25 on warfare in the modern era and this time ladies and gentlemen we're looking at the attitudes to war how attitudes to war have changed in this modern era from roughly 1900 till the present day now the first key change let's go back to world war one World War I, start of the war, many, many people rushed to volunteer. There was a huge enthusiasm for the war. Difficult to understand now, but of course we know what was to happen in the trenches. In 1914, people did not know that. So they were keen to go and fight for their country. Or most people were. There were some people who refused to fight because of religious reasons, for example, they were Quakers or for moral reasons, they were pacifists. And this group of people were known as conscientious objectors, conscious for short. Now, they opposed warfare and they certainly opposed conscription when it was introduced in 1916. And in World War I, there were over 16,000 people who refused to go and fight. Well, what would happen to them? What was society's attitude towards these people? Not very friendly is the simple answer. Women would go round with white feathers and approach men who they thought were of an age to be in the army, say, why aren't you fighting? Here's a white feather, a sign of cowardice. Now, these conscientious objectors had to appear at a military tribunal. Over 9,000 of them agreed to go and serve their country doing non-combat roles, for example, stretcher bearers. But there were about 7,000 people who were sent to prison for their beliefs and they were treated quite harshly. And it did involve injury and death for some people. World War II, again, there were conscientious objectors. This time there were more almost 60,000, maybe because they got the memory, the experience of World War I, and they thought we don't want to do that. Again, a vast majority of them, 50,000, served their country in non-combat roles. And again, a certain percentage, maybe six, 7,000, were sent to prison. In World War II, the treatment was not as hostile, so there's a change in attitude there, compared to World War I, but it was still quite unpleasant. People lost their jobs, people lost their friendships. So there we see, right back in World War I and World War II, an attitude of society towards people maybe who weren't keen to fight. How has that changed? That's what we'll have a look at in this video. Now, Compared to the people who refused to fight, badges like this were produced, ladies and gentlemen, to put in people's windows, their front window, not at home. A man from this house now serving in His Majesty's forces. Can you see what's happened there? People were showing their pride that somebody in their family was fighting for the country fighting for the king. Pride, nationalism, patriotism. Well, did that begin to change as the 20th century went on? That's what we'll have a look at in this video. And then towards the end of the video, we'll have a look at the reasons why maybe that changed. So, our first key change is the reporting of war. War reporting. Now, here's two things. Aha! I've got a very powerful weapon, a sword, compared to a pen. Now, what wins there? Of course, the sword would destroy the pen, you would think. But does it, ladies and gentlemen? Does violence destroy an idea that is written down? 1839 there was a play and the man who wrote that play said the pen 
is mightier than the sword. In other words, what you write down can defeat violence. Interesting thought for you to have a think about. Okay, so as we look at the video, war reporting, what people would write about the war, did it begin to have an impact and change people's minds? Have a thought, think as we go through the video. Now, let's go back into the 1850s, the Crimean War, Britain fighting over in Turkey and Russia. Two very famous photojournalists, a man called Fenton and a man called Howard. They go to the Crimean and they begin to send back reports and they begin to send back photographs. The camera is beginning to change war reporting. 1982, Books Fizz. My camera, oh, oh, my camera never lies anymore. There's nothing worth lying for. The camera beginning to change war reporting, ladies and gentlemen, because it's showing what was going on and it's showing the public. So the Crimean War begins this process of change. Go forward, 1899, 1902, the Boer War. Again, reporters went out to South Africa. I'm going to give you two names. A woman called Emily Hobhouse, and she wrote, the pen, she wrote about the concentration camps that the British were using to put their enemies, wives and children in. And it begins to change people's attitudes. Maybe we should not be doing that. The pen, mightier than the sword. So Emily Hobhouse in the Boer War, and of course a very famous man, later to be even more famous in British history, was over in the Boer War. He was actually captured as a journalist, a reporter writing, and that was of course Winston Churchill. So we see that there's beginning to be a change. When we get to World War I, 1914, only one journalist was allowed to go and report from the battlefield, a man called Colonel Swinton. Now, as you can see, he was also an army officer. By 1916, that had changed and five more selected journalists were able to go and report from the battlefield. Information beginning to come back. Now, why do you think the government would only want a few journalists? Think about, I said at the start of the video, most people were eager to volunteer. But as the war went on and as reporting increased and people began to realise the reality of the war, the number of people volunteering began to decrease. So you can see maybe why the government might want to control the reporting. I'll come back to that later in this video. World War II. 1939, 1945, again, journalists are reporting. A very famous man called Richard Dimbleby. Later, two of his sons would be on BBC and ITV as very famous journalists. Well, Richard Dimbleby was working as a journalist. He actually flew bombing raids, not dropping the bombs, but he's just there experiencing it and then writing about it. He was one of the first journalists to enter Belson concentration camp at the end of the war and he wrote a very very powerful piece and at first the BBC would not uh, produce it and would not show it he had to say look you've got to show it it's important information journalism beginning to get involved now why why does journalism begin to change people's opinions the key word, of course, is technology. I've already mentioned the camera, photographs. Well, look at this book, ladies and gentlemen. Look at the size of it. It's a massive book. And do you know what's in it? Hundreds and hundreds of photographs about World War II. Now, people had to go and take these photographs. Again, we see the impact of journalism, the spread of information. The spread of knowledge, ladies and gentlemen, cameras, photographs. At first, 1900, the telegraph. 
sending information back. But of course, after 1900, technology gets better, technology changes. The radio, the television, the satellite, the mobile phone. The increase in technology led to an increase in sharing knowledge and the public are more informed and they make maybe newer, different decisions. You know, I mentioned earlier about the government maybe not being too keen on war reporting. It leads us to another topic, censorship. Well, what does that mean? Any ideas? Censorship. Limiting or hiding information from the public. Why would the government do that, do you think? Why? Well, here's two reasons. One, to keep up the morale of the people on your side. You don't want to be saying, oh, these terrible things happened. Everyone gets down and depressed. So to keep up your spirits or morale. And secondly, to prevent important key secret information falling into the hands of the enemy. So the government had reasons for introducing censorship. I'm going back in history to the 5th century BC to a Greek dramatist playwright called Aeschylus. And he actually wrote in war, truth is the first casualty. Well, what did he mean? What did he mean by that? Do you think? Simple. In wartime, people tell lies. Leaders, generals, the government tell lies. They don't want the truth to be out there. So, in truth, war is the first casualty. In World War One. 10,000 people were employed. It was their job to read through letters that the soldiers from the trenches were sending home. And they would black, blank out certain parts of the letter. Maybe if it in, included key details like names, dates, location, amount of troops, in case they fell into the enemy hands. We couldn't have that. But also they blanked out Maybe negative comments. What are we doing here? We're losing the war. Things are terrible. No, no, no. Let's keep people's spirits up. So again, we can see censorship was going on. People are telling lies or hiding the truth or stretching the truth. Day one, the Battle of the Somme, known as the bloodiest day in the history of the British Army, 60,000 dead and wounded. A newspaper, the Daily Chronicle, reporting on the first day, 60,000 dead and wounded, 20,000 dead, 40,000 wounded. The Daily Chronicle wrote, fortunately, the proportion of lightly wounded men was wonderfully high. Well, a third were dead. So I'm not sure you could actually say that and actually be telling the truth. Look at the use of the word wonderfully. Oh, don't worry, they're only lightly wounded. That's wonderful news. Can you see what people are doing? Maybe stretching the truth or trying to put their spin on it. Okay. So censorship is a key element, as is propaganda. Those of you who studied Hitler and the Nazis know that they set up a ministry for propaganda. Uncle Joseph Goebbels spinning and telling lies, spinning the truth, telling lies. But all governments do it in wartime. Del propaganda, deliberate use of information to influence public opinion. World War I, they wanted the public to support the war. They encouraged the men to volunteer. So they put out patriotic posters, films, newsreels saying support the lads, come and join up. OK. World War II again. Posters, reports, reporting, censored by the government or self-censored by the newspapers or the TV, all trying to create a positive image. Ladies and gentlemen, here's some proof. I have here a copy of the Daily Express from World War Two. You can just about see the date. Friday, the 31st of May, 1940. 
Well, at that time, ladies and gentlemen, the British army had been defeated in France and they were evacuated from a place called Dunkirk. Churchill himself said, wars are not won by evacuations. We had been defeated. Well, look at the coverage. Let's just have a look at two stories. Tens of thousands safely home already. That is true. But why were they home? Because they'd been defeated by the German army. They basically had to evacuate, flee, run away. Does it say that? Of course not. Down here, another one. Tired, dirty, hungry. They came back unbeatable. Well, ladies and gentlemen, they've just been beaten. Can you see what's happening? They are trying to put a positive spin on bad news. Propaganda. That's what happened in wartime. Now, as we move into the 21st century, from 2000 onwards, again, due to technology, the internet, for example, it's more difficult to control censorship and propaganda. The public have access to far more information now. In 1991, in the first Iraq war, pictures of Iraq being bombed were actually shown before war had officially been declared. Can you see, maybe war reporting has taken over the government's attempts to control. In 2003, in the second Iraq war, the government was still attempting censorship. Reports were read before being given the OK for publication. The number of civilians, casualties, was withheld and only reported afterwards. So censorship, propaganda still attempted, but it's far more difficult now, ladies and gentlemen, far more difficult. Now, earlier in this video, I said, there's been a change in public attitude to warfare. Nowadays, as a whole, we, to make a generalization, maybe we tend to be less in favor of warfare. An old word, jingoism, where people were extremely patriotic and warlike. Remember World War I, I'm working. No, I'm not, I'm throwing my hat in the air. Hooray, I'm going off to fight for my country. Would that be the reaction today, do you think? So we're less jingoistic, we're less patriotic. Why? What has happened? Well, here's some factors. Number one, the reporting. We have more information now. Maybe we're more individuals now, rather than the country. Maybe we're better educated and we can maybe see the news and say, I disagree with that. I question it. Maybe nowadays we tend to question more because we've got more knowledge, because there's less censorship. Also, maybe the government now listen a bit more because more of us can vote. And if we disagree, we could vote them out of office. So reporting is a key factor as is money, finance. World War II, a Spitfire, fantastic plane which helped us in the Battle of Britain and throughout the rest of the war. The Spitfire, one Spitfire, 6,000 pounds. Today, a Typhoon fighter, 80 million pounds. A Trident missile in our submarines, 2.4 billion pounds per year. Well, maybe the public say, hang on, Maybe that money would be better spent not on war, but elsewhere. And maybe that's changed our opinion. Also, of course, human casualties. Go back. 1815, one of the most famous battles, the Battle of Waterloo. Well, on both sides, there's about 50,000 dead. A huge number, of course. 50,000, one battle. Go forward, almost 100 years, 1916. Battle of the Somme, both sides, over 300,000 dead. Human casualties. Go forward, World War II, 
Millions and millions dead, including millions of civilians. Human casualties. Now we think, is it worth it? Or should we not do it? 2003, the Iraq war, there were over 1 million people protesting on the streets. Wow. A million people protesting. Sending the government a message. The government has to heed the message and we get a change developing. Our old friend, cheerful Charlie Change. 1945, the atom bombs, when they were dropped, they were dropped and they had been developed to cause maximum casualties. It's not like that now. We have smart bombs. We have the use of drones unmanned. No personnel involved at all. Nowadays, they're designed to minimise human casualties. There's been a change as a response to the change in public attitude. So, there we have it. I'll finish with one of my terrible, terrible jokes. Why don't the pen and the pencil walk around? I don't know. Why don't the pen and the pencil walk around? Because they're stationary. Way! I apologise. The pen is mightier than the sword. Maybe the reporting of war has meant that people now do not really agree with war as much compared to back in history when they didn't have all the information. Then there was pride. Hooray, my son is over fighting for the country. Do we all think that now or not? Have things changed? Now, in this video, I've mentioned a couple of times the Battle of the Somme, a very, very famous battle from World War I. It's a case study for you. So the next video, I'll examine the Battle of the Somme in far more detail. As ever, I hope it's been useful. I'll speak to you soon. Bye now.